Welcome to lesson number two, learning Java bytecode by examples. I'm going to be using this command line over here in order to display and inspect the bytecode. The first example is going to teach you the basics. So we build it. Then we copy and paste this line over here, and we make sure that we are replacing the class name, right? Now, for the time being, we ignore anything else apart from this section over here, right? So we have an integer, and we have that this integer is going to be equal to 0. Now, this instruction over here requires two lines of bytecode. Why? Well, line 0 is going to be storing the constant 0 into the stack, while line 1 is going to be storing this value into an actual variable. Now, these two, as you can see, they're both starting with an i. That means that we're dealing with an integer. iconst is only able to manage small number, like, for example, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, and pushing the constant into the stack. The same goes for dconst, because these two instructions do exactly the same thing like the previous ones, but they work with double, and this instruction over here is storing this result into variable number two. Now, so far, we've only worked with very, very small values, right? Zero. Now, we need to push something bigger, 97. Well, we can't use const anymore. We need to use by push. By push is able to deal with number between minus 1 to 7 to plus 1 to 7, while C push is able to deal with numbers which are actually bigger than 1 to 7. So, line number 4, we are here, right? Is actually pushing 97 onto the stack. And e-store, see, exactly the same instruction. It's the same logic, right? And here we have one more instruction that push values into a stack. Although this time we don't actually see the number, we only have a pointer at the constant pool, number two, which is 9996. As you can see, this is not the actual memory address. This is just a pointer at the constant pool. This instruction also only works for double and float. And I think for this file, that will be all. Just try to familiarize yourself with the whole output. You know, have a look at this and let's see if it makes sense to you. You know, this syntax that I've explained to you in the previous class. Adding two numbers together. Okay. And so copy and paste this line over here. We make sure that we are pointing on the correct class. So we are storing the constant zero, so the number zero, into the stack. And then we are storing this value into a variable, variable number one, which is a double. Next instruction, we are loading the number 0 as an integer into the stack, and we are storing that value into variable number 3. And you will be asking, why are we not be using variable number 2? Well, that's because of the way the JVM deals and manages float and double. Now, we are here, so we load this variable, and then we load the number two into the stack. We add the variable and number two, and we store the result in variable number three, right? Now, again, we load one, and then we add the value that we get from the constant pool, which is 3.0. 
and then we store the result into variable one. Now here we are doing something different because this instruction over here is able to add two numbers without having to move anything to the stack. And that's the reason why this instruction is actually faster than this. Right? Because it requires less byte code. Now, if you have a look at this instruction over here, it requires more byte code. Why? Well, because this is a float. This is not an integer, right? And I would say that for this file will be all. Let's see how the program flow is defined in the bytecode. So we build the application and then we copy and paste the usual line and we make sure that we are loading the correct class. Now, line zero, we load the zero into the stack and then we store that value into variable number one, which is this one. Now we load variable number one and now we push 10 into the stack. And this is how we implement the if in the bytecode. Now, this only succeed when the first variable, which is this one, is equal to or bigger than the second one, which is this, right? So when this happens, we jump to line 14 and we terminate. If this is not the case, we continue, which means that we increment variable number one by one unit and then go to line two and we continue until the, the cycle ends. And I think that will be all for this file. Java switch. Okay, so we load the two into the stack, right? And then we store it into the variable, we load the variable, and finally the implementation of the switch. Now, table switch can only be used when the values of the case are not dispersed. Like you see, one, two, three, they're all in sequence, there isn't much uh, dispersion. While here, we're going to see that we're going to use a different instruction. So table switch, which implements switch, and then you have a case. Case 1, jump to line 28. Case 2, jump to line 31, and so on. Now, finally, the switch is going to end here. And then you have the new switch here, which is implemented by this lookup switch which is a slightly different in structure. As I said before, you can only use table switch when the cases are not dispersed. Look at the values here, minus 101, 2, and 398. So you need to use lookup switch because table switch will not be efficient. And it works pretty much the same, the same way, right? So if, you, if your answer is minus 101, you jump to line 72. If your answer is 2, you jump to 75, and so on. Classes and arrays. So, we have two classes over here. We are going to investigate this one first. So, we build the application. And then, we point out the first class. So line zero is going to be loading the this instance. Then we have invoke special, which is the initialize phase. And then we load the variables, put field that does this step over here, and then return. Let's move to the second class, so we don't need to build anymore. 
we just need to switch right okay um so we create the object and we create a duplicate inside the stack because you can see that we have two instructions that are going to be using the same object so we need to have two objects inside the stack because every time you use it you need to remove it also that that's the way the stack works right so we duplicate we load the five into memory we have the invoke special which is going to run the actual constructor and then we store the object inside the memory now we load the object and now we run this method over here let's have a look at the array part so we push 10 onto the stack and then we create an instance of an array of 10 integers right so although arrays are objects in java we can't use new to create arrays we need to use new array then we store the array we load it and then we push 0 and 2 onto the stack and then we store whatever we put into the stack into the array and then we load this print stream over here we load the array we push 0 onto the stack and then we retrieve the element at index 0 and then we invoke the print and I think for this file will be will be all in regarding to try and catch blocks you should be able to figure it out pretty much everything by yourself but still there is something that I really want to show you and that's the exception table now the field from two is telling you which kind of exception is caught within this range so from line zero to nine you are catching arithmetic exception and as you can see we are dividing 15 by zero and also we are catching runtime exception now the field target instead tells the JVM where to jump to when these exceptions are actually occurring and I think that will be all for this file and the last thing is synchronization now when you have a block of code which is supposed to be synchronized the JVM is going to be using these two instructions monitor enter and monitor exit which define which block of code is going to be synchronized instead when the whole method is supposed to be synchronized that method is going to receive a label Thank you very much, and I hope you've enjoyed my course. Thank you.